So today we're going to talk about um, teacher engagement um, with research. Um, I think it's, uh, it fits in well with the, with the kind of work we're doing in the theme of, of the symposium, which is teacher as researcher. Just to make a couple of initial distinctions, um, we can distinguish between engagement um, with research, and when we talk about teacher engagement with research, fundamentally we're talking about teachers uh, reading research, uh, and that's what I'll focus on. And this is often contrasted with engagement in research, which is the process of doing research. Um, it's something you're doing as well as part of this project. But my focus today uh, will be on the first of these. If we think about, I'll just use the abbreviation EWR for engagement with research, okay? If we think about reasons for doing it, it's easy to identify many potential benefits of reading research for teachers. Um, by reading research, we can deepen our own understanding of our work. Research can also help us justify what we do. In other words, we may have practices, we know they work, but if someone asks us why it works, very often we may struggle to provide a justification. And reading research can help us in that respect. Reading research can also give us ideas to experiment with. We can read something, it might trigger off a thought, we can go back to the classroom and play around and experiment with it. And another potential benefit of reading research, it, it, it can enhance our, our professional language, our professional discourse. It allows us to talk about teaching in a different way, in a more informed way. And I'm sure we could add to this list um, at the outset, but there are clearly a number of potential benefits to teachers um, of engaging with research. And if we look at some of the published evidence in the literature, um, we can see evidence of some of these benefits. So here's a, a paper that was published in 2006 uh, by Rankin and Becker. And this study reports the way that a, a foreign language teacher um, engaged with the research on error correction. So they were reading about error correction. And the, the paper tells us how reading the research enhanced the teacher's reflections about his own work. So he was able to go back and think about the way he was correcting errors and reading research contributed to that process. However, I think a lot of the evidence we have about teachers reading research comes from uh, course-based professional development. Course-based professional development is where teachers are sent on courses. It might be a master's course, it might be a bachelor's course, some kind of formal course where teachers are taken out of school for a while. And in that kind of situation, of course, teachers have the time, they have the space, they have the support to engage with research. Sometimes they have to, whether they like it or not, because they have to do assignments. And in fact, the, the Rankin and Becker study I just referred to in, in, that, in that study, the teacher was actually doing a course at university. I'm more interested in how we can make um, engagement with research part of school-based teacher development. I think that's where the challenges are greatest. And the project we're here to celebrate is a perfect example of school-based teacher development. And it's one of the great things about it. Teachers are not being sent away from school not being taken out of the classroom to further their own professional development. On the contrary, professional development is grounded in the classroom. And I, I think if we look at what we know about professional development, we know that there's, there are many strong arguments for school-based professional development as opposed to course-based. So my particular interest is how can we make engagement with research a more productive part of school-based professional development. So, the starting point for, for my interest in this topic is an awareness of a gap. I think the potential, the potential contribution to teachers' professional development of engagement with research is huge. Um, in reality, the realization of this, of this potential is generally small. So we have a gap here between potential and what happens in practice. 
And that's been the stimulus for my interest um, in this particular topic. Now, there are a number of warnings, I think, before I proceed um, to explore this issue. The first one is when I say that teachers don't read research very often, I'm not criticizing teachers. Okay? This is not a talk that is critical of teachers. And people who are familiar with my work uh, will know that a lot of my work tries to understand what teachers do, tries to understand the situations in which teachers work as a way of supporting them. So this is not at all um, critical of teachers. I'm also not saying that engagement with research should be the priority in teachers' lives. I'm not saying that reading research is more important than planning your lessons, than paying attention to your learners, than assessment. What we're saying is engagement with research is a professional development option that has potential for us. But we're not saying it's the most important thing. When we encourage teachers to read research, we're also not saying that teachers need to read research because they're bad at their job. So we're not adopting what we call a deficit perspective here. We're not saying teachers aren't good, therefore, we need, therefore they need to read. We're looking at reading research as a way of supporting um, teachers' work. And finally, I'm also not saying that reading research will tell you what to do in the classroom. If you're reading research in order to identify solutions, immediate solutions to your problems, you will probably be, probably be, be disappointed. That's not the purpose of research, and I'll come back to that point later, okay? What we are saying is that reading research there's potential to support teachers' development. Let's try and think about reasons why it doesn't happen as much as it could and what we might do about that. So I've, I've done, a, I've done a, a number of projects related to this issue in um, recent years. Um, one of the questions I've been exploring is what is the nature of teachers' engagement with research? How often do teachers read research? What kind of material do they read? What kind of impact does it have on their practice? I've been exploring these kinds of questions. A second question I've been looking at is what factors influence this engagement? In particular, what factors hinder teachers' engagement with research? And so I've um, conducted a, a program of research consistent, consisting of a number of smaller studies. Um, this program ran for six years, so 2005 to 2011, um, with about 2,500 teachers taking part from around the world. And data were collected through, um, through questionnaires and through interviews. Those were the two main strategies for collecting data. And what the individual studies had in common is they were, they were all looking at the issue of engagement um, in and with research, from teachers' perspectives though, trying to understand from teachers' perspectives how often they participate in these activities and what factors influence that participation. And I'd like to go over some of the findings briefly uh, because I think they do, they do further our understandings of this issue. So one basic question I've asked teachers in this program of research is how often do you read research? How often do you read research? And based on your one sample of just over 1,300 teachers there, um, we get a graph which looks like this. I must apologize for the people sitting here. I'm trying, when you read books on presentations, they, they say to you, when you've got an audience, you know, look that way every now and then, look down the middle every now and then, and look to the right every now and then to make sure everyone feels they're getting some personal attention. But this room is so wide that if I keep doing that all the time, I'll probably end up getting dizzy and falling off the stage. <laughs> so I do apologize. I'm not ignoring you. It's, um, it's just a, a, limit, a physical limitation, probably physical limitation of my neck, not being flexible enough. Maybe my tie's too tight. So we get, a graph, we get a graph like that with 50% so of teachers saying you know, they read research sometimes, um, 25 saying often, 
25 saying rarely. Now, of course, we need to interpret these kinds of results cautiously. For example, no one in my study said never. None of the teachers. Never was an option. None of the teachers said I never, need research, I never read research. Um, so we need to interpret these results cautiously. And what I tend to do is I tend to say, well, sometimes probably means rarely. And rarely probably means never. So it's, it's about being cautious. I could get carried away and say, well, at least 75% read research at least sometimes, which sounds great. But I'm not, going, I'm not going to get carried away. I'll be a bit more cautious. One of the things I've done in this, in this project as well is I go back to teachers and I say, what do you mean by sometimes? What do you mean by always? Here's what teachers say when I ask them. What do you mean when you say you read research sometimes? So teachers clearly have different ideas about what sometimes means. And this is, this, is a, this is a problem with questionnaire items of this type, of course. They are open to interpretation. But clearly, on the basis of that evidence, we can conclude that sometimes probably means rarely in many cases, OK? In many cases. Um, So, you know, very modest, I'd say, modest levels of engagement with, with research being reported here. In a, in, a, in a separate study which looked just at teachers in China, we also asked them this question. And again, we got a graph which looked like that. Um, here we made a distinction between, between occasionally, which is sort of sometimes, and periodically. And what happened in this study, when we piloted the study, the Chinese teacher said to us, well, often, sometimes, rarely, and never, they don't cover all the possibilities for us. They said there's another possibility for us, that when it's time to apply for a promotion, we read a lot more. <laughs> so we decided to put that in as, as an option, and we called it periodically. And this is what the teachers in China said. When it's time to apply for a promotion, we need to show evidence that we've been professionally active. And so we, we have a, a splurge. We read lots of papers very intensively for a short while, and then we won't do it again for a few years. So that's what we mean by periodically there. But in essence, the graph is, is, is the same shape, with teachers saying um, we do it occasionally, which again probably means rarely. We also asked the teachers, what do you read? So if teachers said, uh, I read research often, or I re read research sometimes, what do you read? I just need to remind you, we didn't give them the option of saying always, because what does that mean? I read research always. It doesn't make, it doesn't make sense, does it? You've got these visions of people constantly having an article in the bath, in the shower, in the car. So we didn't give them the option of always. Often was the most frequent option. So teachers who said they read often or sometimes were also asked, what do you read? And this is what the responses look like, with the most common category or source of reading being uh, professional magazines and journals, books, academic journals, web based material, and newsletters. Now keep in mind, we're asking the teachers about research. They said we read research, and we said, what do you read? And it's interesting that the most common category here is professional magazines and journals. These are not publications that normally carry research. Okay, so when we think about professional magazines or professional journals, uh, these are not research publications. They normally contain more practical material. So, and this suggests an interesting distinction, maybe which we can help teachers in making between different types of literature, between literature, between sources which have a more practical orientation, a more practical origin, and um, literature which is based on research, which has been generated through systematic study. And so here are teachers in their, in their interviews and in their written comments explaining the type of reading they do. Here's a teacher from Switzerland saying, 
Um, I sometimes try out things I've read about, but these are usually practical tips from teachers. And we were getting this from a lot of teachers who said they read research. When we asked them, what do you read? They said, we read practical magazines. We read tips for teachers. We also interviewed, uh, I also interviewed some managers as part of the project. And they were, they were making similar comments about the reading their teachers did. So this manager in the UK is saying, I think what most of our teachers read is not necessarily research. Uh, they read a lot of stuff about teaching ideas, but they're looking for practical ideas that are not necessarily based on research. And so a useful distinction we can make when we think about the reading teachers do is between more practically oriented material and material which is based on research, which has been generated through systematic study. I'm not saying one is more important than the other. I'm not saying teachers should read research and not practical material. Of course not, that would be silly to say that. Practical ideas, practical literature will always have greater appeal to teachers. But what we're trying to suggest is there is also room for reading other types of literature, literature which is more research-based. And of course, the two types of reading, as the double-headed arrow there suggests, can interact. They're not in opposition, they can work together to support teachers' work. So one of the things to come out of the project was perhaps a, a confusion in teachers' minds about what constitutes research in terms of publications. And one thing we can do in terms of supporting teachers, I think, is to help, help them to think about these different types of literature. So we asked teachers, do you read research? How often do you read research? Teachers who said rarely or never were asked why. What are the reasons for not reading research? Can I just give you a quick minute to tell each other, perhaps based on your own experiences, what do you think some of the reasons are that teachers don't read research? Just a quick minute. Okay, let's have a look. Here are the reasons that teachers identified in, uh, in, in my work. All right. So your, um, your reaction there suggests these are the kinds of reasons you would predict. And clearly we know anyone who works with teachers would be able to anticipate some of these reasons. Time is always mentioned. In fact, whenever we ask teachers about anything they don't do, time is always the first reason that's given. And of course this has clear implications. If we do want to encourage teachers to be doing any form of professional development, we do need to make sure that we think about where the time for it is going to come from. Okay? Time is always going to be an important consideration. I will come back to that. Um, the second most common reason there is research does not give me practical advice. And this is a point I'll come back to because this is another one of those perhaps unhelpful attitudes or misconceptions about the purpose of research. The purpose of research is not to give teachers immediate practical solutions to their classroom problems. So if that's what teachers are looking for in research, clearly they're going to be disappointed. So we need to do some work perhaps on teachers' expectations there, and I'll come back to it. There's an issue of access. Again, if we want teachers to read research, we need to think about whether they can get their hands on it. And if they can't, what can we do about that? Uh, finding it hard to understand, issues to do with conceptual accessibility there. And, you know, a, a relatively small number, I guess, 50, but still interesting, saying, I'm not interested. I'm not interested. So, perhaps issues to do with um, professional attitudes there, or just understandings of research, conceptions of research. So here are teachers talking about you know, the lack of practical value. Here's a teacher from Taiwan explaining why they don't read research. Um, research articles are often, usually, 
completely unengaging and of no practical value in the classroom. I've heard this many times from teachers in many different places. Here's a teacher in China um, saying similar things, saying I, it doesn't work in my context. They're saying we were once asked to promote uh, multimedia teaching and I read some papers um, advocating computer-aided instruction. So this teacher went off, found some research papers on computer-aided instruction. I followed their ways, so the teacher tried to repeat in his classroom what the researchers had done, tried twice, but the results were different from theirs. Finally, I gave up and lost interest. And I think the issue here is about teachers coming, coming to research with unhelpful expectations. You know, the idea that you can pick up a paper, read it, repeat it in your classroom, and achieve exactly the same results is not a helpful one, because you know, the original research will have been done in a different context, etc. So that's not the purpose of research. It's not to give us a formula which we can apply with guarantees of success. So we'll come back to this one soon. So what we have here, we have, uh, we have teachers generally thinking about the relationship of research and classroom practices in a, in, a, in a direct way. Teachers very often think, I'll read research, and this will feed in directly and immediately into what I do in the classroom. And that's problematic. It doesn't work in that way. As I've said, the purpose of research is not to give us immediate solutions to local problems. What we need, as this quotation reminds us, is to remember that teachers need to apply critical interpretation to what they read. So this quote tells us, there will always be a skilled professional job to do in interpreting the relevance of and implications of evidence for a practitioner's own setting. So the teacher needs to mediate the research, to interpret the research, to make decisions about how it might be used, if it might be used. So you know, our, our diagram might look something like that. We, we want teachers to engage with research, but we also need to make sure that teachers are thinking critically about what they're reading, making professional judgments about the suitability and the relevance of what they're reading before making decisions about what to do in the classroom. And so again, in terms of professional development, in terms of supporting teachers in using research, there may be scope for us to do some work on developing teachers' abilities to respond critically to what they read. So what have I said so far? I said, so generally speaking, you know, if we're going to be generous, we would say there are modest levels of engagement with research in English language teaching around the world. Moderate levels, and I think that's, that's quite generous. We know that one of the problems, one of the, one of the issues is that teachers have problematic expectations about what research can do for them this expectation that research can solve problems straight away is problematic and that's something to work on. And we know that there are also various barriers to teachers engaging with research. There are barriers to do with access, being able to get hold of material. There are sometimes barriers to do with understanding, sometimes even linguistic barriers. And we need to think about all of these if we're going to find some productive responses to support teachers. Okay, I'm going to go through a number of possible responses now to these, to these challenges, okay? The first one is what we might call consumer training. First one, what we might call consumer training. I know it doesn't seem to fit in with the flavor of professional development we're talking about here. Um, teachers sometimes are thought of as consumers of research. So someone generates the research and the teachers consume it. And yeah, we, we get um, quotations such as this, which reflect this idea of the teacher as a consumer. Um, it says, educational research is for the benefit of the field as a whole, not just for a handful of specialists. That is why it is important for you, and this is being written for teachers, 
to improve your skills as a consumer of research. Now, I think there's some value in this idea, the idea that in order to get the most out of research, teachers need to have the skills to read it and to interpret it. So I think there is some value in thinking about teachers as consumers, but I don't think that's the whole solution. And um, because that kind of reduces engagement with research to technical procedures. In other, in other words, it, it suggests that all we need to do is train teachers to read research and then everyone will start reading it. But we know that even where teachers have the ability to read research critically, it doesn't mean that they will do so. Because there are other factors. As we've said, teachers need the ability to read critically. Teachers need to have the right attitude towards research. They need to have the motivation. They need to have time. They need to have access. So technical skills, training teachers to engage with research, is just one part of, I think, a bigger solution. But it's something to keep in mind. Second um, response, clearly, if access is a problem, if teachers don't have access to research, we need to think about how to address that. And as I said, we're thinking about physical access, so what, what can we do to make it easier, or to make it more possible, for teachers to get hold of research? For example, there are a number of good quality, free, online, language teaching journals available these days. They're free, they're online, and they're good quality. So a, a simple starting point is making teachers aware of these. It's a very simple starting point. Um, it doesn't cost anything. We're not talking about expensive subscriptions to journals here. There's also the linguistic access. Teachers sometimes find research hard to read. And there are, I think, roles for mentors to play here in mediating that kind of problem. And other solutions for teachers to work collaboratively on this issue. And the same applies to conceptual challenges. Sometimes the ideas may be challenging. There are, of course, implications here, of course, for those who write the research reports. Okay. The people writing research very often are not writing it with an audience of teachers in mind. And this is also part of the problem, that the people writing the research maybe need to be more, more concerned about their eventual readers. But clearly, enhancing access is something we need to think about. A third part of the strategy, I think, needs to address attitudes. I've, I've already given you a number of examples of unhelpful attitudes towards research. So the kinds of attitudes we want to develop in teachers in relation to research are the following. Research is a source of possibilities, not solutions. That's a, that's a healthy attitude towards research. Research is a source of possibilities, not solutions. Research is enabling, not de-skilling. In other words, what we want teachers to understand is we want you to read research because it will enhance your professionality. It will enhance your professional skills. Not make you less autonomous, because sometimes teachers worry about that. They worry that researchers are trying to take away their autonomy by telling them what to do. But that's not the case. We want teachers to understand as well that research has a facilitative function. It facilitates reflection. It facilitates reflection. It facilitates professional development. It's not determinative. In other words, it's not trying to tell teachers exactly what to do in their classroom. And one final example of a healthy attitude is we want teachers to approach the research they read critically. We want them to look at it and to make informed decisions about whether to use it or not. And the decision may be not to use it, but that decision needs to be an informed one. So here's an example of a teacher um, from one of my projects talking about how she makes decisions 
um, about whether to use the research she reads. Um, she says, research I read will influence me if I agree with it. And I've underlined that phrase, if I agree with it. Is this critical reflection or biased rejection? It seems to be the latter to me, it's if I agree with it. And she says, I look at it critically first. But when she says critically there, she doesn't mean critically in the way I'm talking about it. She means I criticise it, I look for all the problems in it. Because a lot of the things that are published, I won't quite agree with. But if I agree with it, I'll take it further and I'll try it and see if it works with my own students. This teacher seems to be making premature decisions. She looks at it and says, no, that's not going to work in my situation, let's move on. That's not the kind of attitude you want to promote um, when we talk about informed engagement with research. I haven't come across any books written for teachers with this title. And I'm not quite sure if, we, if anyone did try to publish a book with this title. It would be very popular. Um, when teachers come up to me and say, that article you wrote is very theoretical, it's not normally a compliment. And when they talk to me about training they've attended, and they said that was theoretical, that too is normally not a compliment. So we have a problem very often with teachers' attitudes towards theory. Theory, unfortunately, very, has ne very often has negative connotations for teachers. Um, this book is a music book. It's a music book. And in, you know, if you're learning music, learning theory is an accepted part of the process, isn't it? Accepted part of the process. Um, now, in education, Teachers have negative attitudes towards theory very often, but the problem is not theory. Theory has an important role to play in our work as professionals. So it's not theory itself that is the problem, it's the way that teachers experience theory. It's the way that teachers experience theory. And very often they experience theory in a way that is disconnected from practice. So another suggestion here for improving engagement with research is to give it pedagogical relevance. How can we make engagement with research, how can we make the process of reading research a pedagogically relevant one? How can we connect it with the classroom? Because that's what teachers are interested in, the classroom. And so we can imagine some kind of reflective cycle where we have, the classroom, we have classroom practice, as a useful starting point, maybe. And we think about what's going on in our classroom and we reflect on that. And as a result, we are motivated to go and do some reading, which we reflect on and which, again, feeds back into the classroom. So classroom practice can be the starting point in this cycle, of course, but reading can also be the starting point in this cycle. We may read something reflect on it, and that may be something we take forward into the classroom and helps us think about our teaching. So a big question for us in professional development, how can we make engagement with research pedagogically relevant? And I think if I had to choose one of the different solutions I'm talking about, this would probably be the one I'd want to focus most on. Because once it becomes pedagogically relevant, teachers see a good reason for it. Teachers then have a motivation for using research, okay? The last solution I'm going to talk about is making engagement with research collaborative. Now, I don't need to talk to you about the benefits of collaborative professional development because this project is a perfect example of collaborative work amongst teachers in all its glory, in a sense. Okay, so you're very familiar with the benefits that emerge when teachers work together. Engagement with research doesn't have to be a solitary process. Very often we have this image of teachers sitting alone in a dark room with an article to read. That's quite sad. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. We can think about it as a happy, social, collaborative experience where teachers read together and talk about their reading together. 
And this is not only relevant for teachers. Um, I was walking along the corridor in, in my department um, a week ago, and I saw a sign on a notice board. This was you know, for, for, for me and my colleagues in our department. And the sign said, tired of reading theory on your own? And it went on to say, come and join us for our reading groups. So there are reading groups for academics. And if, if academics can benefit from collaborative engagement with research, there's no reason why it doesn't work for teachers as well. So it's, it's an, it's a, I think it's an important part of the strategy. So we can have teacher reading groups. And on the, on the um, handout you've got there, there is some further reading. And there's an interesting article by uh, Fenton Smith and Stilwell. Fenton Smith and Stilwell, who talk about a teacher reading group in Japan where teachers got together to read, to talk about their reading, and to connect it with practice. It's all about making connections between theory and practice. And that would be a useful article for you to have a look at. So the collaborative work could be among teachers. We could also have external partners involved. We could have people coming in from the outside to facilitate teacher reading groups. Um, these days, with social networks, there are lots of virtual possibilities as well. So we can have virtual collaborative engagement with research. And I think this needs to be an important part of any strategy to make engagement with research a more productive part of teachers' lives. So my argument has been that engagement with research has, has great potential for teachers' professional development. I really do believe that. And it's potential that is not, not realized to any great extent. Um, we know that from experience. We know that from research, in particular the kind of um, research I've been doing in recent years. And I think it's useful for us to think about ways in which we can respond to that. And I, I, I've gone over a number of possible ways of doing that. And just to summarize the strategy, we want engagement with research, or engagement with research will be more productive when it's skilled. This goes back to what we said about consumer training. We've got skilled readers. When it's pedagogical, when engagement with research has a strong pedagogical focus, it's connected with practice. Its purpose is to enhance practice. When it's accessible, linguistically, conceptually, physically. And I think we can also think about time as being an access issue. When it's reflective, we want teachers to be reflecting on what they read, not dismissing it uncritically, not accepting it uncritically, not expecting immediate solutions to local problems. That's never going to work. We want teachers to reflect on what they're reading and to use it in an informed, professional way. And we want it to be collaborative. We want it to be collaborative. Things are much easier, much more enjoyable, much more productive when they're collaborative. Now, if you want an acronym to help you remember this, this model, if you start from skilled and you work clockwise, uh, you end up with S-P-A-R-C. So you might think of spark with a C there, okay? Spark, a spark model for engagement with research. But you can also start from the S and go anti-clockwise. And you would end up with the memorable, but less impressive, perhaps, scrap. Now, I don't mind whether you, you prefer to go for spark or for scrap, whichever one helps you remember this model most effectively. But I think if we want to pursue teacher development more fully, um, there is a problem if all of the work that's done by researchers is ignored. Okay? Research has a clear role to play in promoting teacher development, and I hope that some of the ideas I've uh, discussed with you today can inform your thinking as you move forward in your careers. Thank you very much.